freedom and happiness. That's all I want, freedom and happiness. Whenever your gut instinct is screaming at you, you got to listen to it. Oh, what's the secret of business and all this shit? I'm like, you've got to go and create it and take it. Hang out with the people who are doing the kind of stuff that you want to do. There's endless examples of people who are traveling the world and making their money online and your whole life changes. You're listening to The Remote Revolution Show, the show that brings insights from industry experts across the world of digital business, so you too can take your business online, travel the world, and live with freedom. If you're new to the show, the podcast is produced every Tuesday for your enjoyment, and show notes can be found at www.remoterevolutionshow.com. Come back often and feel free to add the show to your favorites in your YouTube, Spotify, and iTunes feeds. If you want to follow us on social media, which you should because we're awesome, join the community by searching for at Remote Fit Pro, where you'll find daily content to help you explore the remote revolution oh yeah and if you want to connect with us individually you can do that too via the links in the show notes now let's get into this week's episode with your hosts james moody and george crawshaw hello and welcome to the remote revolution show today we have an absolutely incredible incredible guest james has got another special interview for you over in Thailand, live with Luke Richmond. This guy is an author and an incredible adventurer from the outback in Australia. And I say incredible, I'm not just hyping this up. This guy has done some absolutely amazing, amazing things. He lives a, a very extreme lifestyle, whether he's climbing mountain, jumping off cliffs, rowing an ocean. He lives and breathes for a life of freedom and being ready for anything that comes your way. This guy's faced multiple near-death experiences and i'm not just talking like nearly getting hit by a car i'm talking about falling off mountains you know being stranded in the middle of the ocean with huge huge waves hitting you okay and uh, he talks about his stories and and how you can learn from facing your greatest fears and putting yourself in the most uncomfortable position for yourself and for your life and how that will help you grow and ultimately give you the the greatest amount of freedom because this is what this is all about this this show is all about finding more freedom and that really 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 comes from within and this is what luke uh, shares today and, and james is with him over in thailand let's get over there for this special episode with luke and james so luke how are you getting on today well it's a good day another day in uh, phuket nice and relaxed yeah, man, we're sitting in your little bungalow. We are. Bungalow. This is the spot, mate. This is where we hang out. Sitting in a plastic chair, living the life. Well, I've got everything you need. Just nice and simple and just um, full of health and happiness, shall we say. Yeah, man. <laughs> but the simple life, I'd say, is what you lead, but at the same time, it's a pretty extreme life, right? Oh, man, absolutely, yeah. I mean, the, in the conventional life, we're very simple. We don't have many possessions bar adventure kit. Um, we don't have mortgages. We don't have liabilities. But the life we live is is to the extreme. We go on big adventures every year and do a lot of traveling and really get amongst the experiences. Yeah. Yeah, man. So let's dive into that and let's go back to, to where it was started for you. So I don't know where you want to start as a school kid, if you want to start when you're standing on top of the mountaintop, like you tell in your book. Well, uh, I guess a bit of backstory. I, um, I grew up in Australia in the outback. So I was um, born a country kid. Then I sort of had a bit of half and half. I grew up in the desert in the outback until sort of the start of high school. And my parents knew that I needed a bit more of an education because out there you do school on the radio. So it's like this two-way radio to a teacher that's like a thousand kilometers away. And you do it for a couple of hours a day. So it's not very extensive and the rest is homeschool. So when it started to get to only like 11 or 12, mum and dad knew we needed proper schooling. So they drove to the coast and put us through high school. So I had a good blend of country upbringing and the city side of things as well, which was a great start. I was into the military then, done my four years with the Australian Army, and then I took off traveling overseas. Just wanted to see the world, have adventures, and sort of get involved in everything. I ended up, after doing a lot of traveling um, in London, and there was a you know, big drinking culture back, back when you're in your 20s, I guess, early 20s. Um, and there was a lot of recreational drug use around me at the time, so I started to partake in a bit of that. Uh, couldn't control it and um, ended up with a bit of a drug addiction in those days. And I had that uh, cliched rock bottom point, you know, where I woke up in jail, I was um, getting hosed down by the police because I was sort of covered in my own filth. And um, I think it took just that, that shame to, to drive that, that point that it had to change. Like I had to do something and change my way of life. 
So I got released from jail that next day. I was in a bad place, I didn't stop doing drugs that day. I went home, got straight back into it. But I called an old army friend of mine, um, a guy named Liam, and I said, mate, I need some help. I've got to get out of this situation I'm in, this, this city. And he said, fly to this place in Thailand called Tiger Muay Thai, this fitness camp. And, and I was out of it, I said, done. So I got on my laptop, booked the flight. I was finishing my drugs in the taxi on the way to the airport and flew out high as a kite and started um, you know, getting sick on the plane as I was flying to Phuket. Landed here, so this is back in 2008, and started training. I started doing six hours a day of Muay Thai to go cold turkey off all the drugs, stop drinking totally, and um, just you know, had that turn your life around moment where it could have gone one way, where guys that I was with back in those days are either dead or in jail, um, but stuff I've you know, achieved since then in the last 10 years has been you know, above and beyond anything you could ever imagine. So that was the, um, the turning point, six hours a day of Muay Thai. Wow, and yesterday, uh, I saw you back in that exact gym where it all started, right? All those years <laughs> yeah. ago. I know, and as funny as it is, I'm giving a talk up there on Friday about the last 10 years of adventure and the beginning and all this type of stuff. And it's sort of coming full circle, you could say, from being on your ass, you know, addicted, no direction in life, to now knowing exactly who you are and what you're on about and sharing your adventures and stories and lessons learned over the last few years with everyone else. So Awesome, man. So let's delve into that next 10 year period now for you. So you come to Tiger, you come to Thailand. What was the breakthrough mentally that happened for you to be like, fuck this shit. I need, mm. to, I need to become the person who you know I'm born to be. What happened internally? Mate, a big part of it was just getting um, getting clean. So apart from the, the drugs, I was always drunk. So when you're under that sort of um, haze of addiction and, and alcohol, it sort of suppresses your mind a little bit. So you don't have those dreams and aspirations and imagination that you do when you're younger. So once I got off everything, and at the end of a month of doing this heavy training and just cleansing your body of everything, your mind wakes up. So then I start having dreams again about stuff that I'd read about as a kid, you know, adventure novels and climbing books and the polar explorers and Jack London story, all this stuff that wakes up, you go, geez, I wanna, that's what I wanna do. I wanna get into these, these big adventures. And so that's where my mindset started to shift towards. So then if I wanted to go and climb a mountain, well, I needed some money. So I was, I was broke, I had nothing. All I had was my health back. Um, I was lucky in Australia at the time, there was a big mining boom on. So I flew home, got a mining job and crushed it for nine months straight, built up this treasure chest. And then I thought, right, this is it. I'm going to become an adventurer. You know, I had no idea. I went online and found this list of mountains called the Seven Summits the biggest mountain on each continent. I thought, that's it, I'm, I'm doing that, I'm gonna climb those. And I'm not gonna do it over the next 10 years, I'm gonna do it all next year. So I set my goal to climb these seven in one year. So I got online, ordered every bit of kit I could ever need to do with this type of mountaineering, got it all delivered, and I booked a spot on a team that was going down to climb in South America, Aconcagua, the biggest one down there. So I was off, that was the start of my adventure career. Shit, bro, wow. So. Let's, let's just go back a step here. So you've been on the streets homeless, effectively in London, or near enough. Well, yeah, you could call it very close to, very, yeah. Very, very <laughs> yeah. close to. You then spoke to someone who's been like, get your ass to Tiger. You've yeah. come to Tiger, you've come clean in that period. I'm guessing the environment was a huge thing for you, like just full submersion in that environment. And extraction from a bad one. So extraction from that environment that was just giving me nothing, um, and the situation I was in, to put into a totally new environment where you could reinvent yourself, the influences were better, it's based on health and fitness, and it just changed everything. I've got a question here, because a lot of people want to move to new areas of their life and try new things, and they've got this big hold up about their past and their friendship circles, their job, whatever it is. What went through your head? Was, it, was there any sort of inclination where it's like, oh no, I need to still make my friends happy, or were you just like, fuck this shit now, I'm going to Thailand? Was, was there anything holding you back? Mate, there, there's a transition period, hey? And I think, I know we've all made that sort of transition where you can't let other people or your environment or um, society's influences dictate what you do, mm. but it's hard. So you battle against that for a while. But in the end, sometimes you gotta cut people away. Like I know one year I said, right, anybody that's not um, making me better and who was always taking from me in some way, um, I just, just cut them out of my life, like totally. And anyone that was giving, you give more to them and they give back. And you have this tight circle around you. You're a product of, of those five people that are around you at any one time. And if they're just not 
good people or they're negative or it's not that they're not good people, they're just negative or yeah. just stuck in a rut. Well, that's where you're going to end up as well. So you have to go through that transition of, of new environment and really, I guess, so just backing yourself. Mm. Back yourself to, to go and achieve what you want to achieve. And was there any like routines or anything you put in place to make sure that you went, when you were here 10 years ago, to make sure you kept going? Was there anything that you actively said to yourself or did on a daily basis to make sure that you stayed on that path to become where you are today? You know what, when I was in that situation back then, my only goal was just to get clean. It was just to make a big change. And I guess the, the repercussions of not doing that was enough to motivate me to get up and go again, get up and go again, because you're not going back to the mm. fucking watch house, you know, getting hosed down. So that was enough to keep me moving. Um, and then over the years, depending on what I've set out to achieve in different environments and different mountains, you find a, a different way to motivate yourself. For sure, for yeah. sure. So you've been through to, through to extreme pain, that's fair enough to say, in many different areas. And now you, you sort of seek extreme risk, but at the same time, you're very aware of what's going on. So let's go back to that mountain back in South Africa, was it? Or in South Africa? America, the South first America. one. So this is uh, Mount Aconcagua. It's the biggest one yep. in, in South America, just under 7,000 meters, so it's big. And I knew nothing, so I'm just a total amateur. I was very fit though, like probably the fittest I'd ever been. And I had a, a strong mindset and I was ready to go. So off we went and it took us, well, we were actually on the mountain for about 16, 17th day. And we had reports coming down from the top of the mountain that some teams had pushed to the summit a little bit early and a big storm came through that was sort of uh, unforecasted and had caught these guys out in the open. And um, what happened, they got disorientated as whiteout conditions and these guys actually died up there. So here I am, this, this amateur on this mountain, a couple of weeks into it, struggling, because it's hard, and um, then the reports come down that these guys are dead. So you know, we sort of just back each other again and you keep moving, and then we're on our summit day, uh, three days later, heading to the top, and we get to our first ridge line where we have our first little rest after a number of hours, you know, going through the dark. And the sun's coming up and it's all beautiful, but then on the, on the side of the trail, there was one of these Spanish climbers frozen, you know, wrapped in a silver blanket. And you, you sort of have this, this massive moment of reflection. Like, like I'd seen, you know, my, my first dead bodies in the military, but these are bad guys. You don't have a connection to, to bad guys. This was me, this was a climber. It could have been 10 years more experience than me and he's here now. You're, you're literally looking potentially your future in the yeah. face. And right. you ask those deep questions of yourself, geez, what am I doing here? You shouldn't be here, you don't know anything about this. But then you just you know, convince yourself, no, like just like I did before, I'm healthy, I'm strong as I've ever been, I've got the right mindset, I've got a good you know, team around me, we're working together, and you push on. And we were successful, we summited, perfect conditions, and got back off safely. But that was the first time, you know, one of many to come, where mountaineering puts death right in front of your face. It's like right there, it's just there all the time. And I started um, analyzing death differently. Like I, started, I confronted it and said, well, we are gonna die. I used to think I'm gonna live to 100. I've got so much time, 100, 90, I'll be sweet. But you don't. Statistically, we're gonna be dead before we're 60. And then when I started seeing these climbers dying on, on the track, it put it right in front of your face. So now, what I do with, with myself and now my wife, we sort of do the same thing. We, we work in five year blocks. So we say, we are gonna die in five years, that's it. Guaranteed you're done in five. What are we gonna do from now until that five? And that's how we stack up our adventures or what we wanna achieve in our work or anything. We stack that up and go, right, that's what we're gonna do. And if you get there, beautiful, go another five. But we don't think we're gonna live forever anymore. And that's a, a very good thing for a lot of people just to analyze, just give yourself a five year question and see what comes out. Wow, man, that's extreme goal setting right there. Yeah, right. Like, extreme <laughs> fucking goal setting. Cause there's something that I'm really interested in and that's raising necessity. So what I mean by that is raising the stakes. So when you look at top performers, I know obviously you do CrossFit and, and obviously your wife is now at regionals, which is amazing. Yeah, she's uh, doing well. Yeah, <laughs> she's crushing it, which is cool. Um, but uh, what's her name? Katarina Davis' daughter, Yeah, I think. Yeah, wrote on her shoes, mama, um, during the 2016 or 15 CrossFit Games. And uh, that was her grandma who passed away. Mm. And in the documentary, she keeps referring to seeing mama on her feet because now it's bigger than herself. Like she's set a mission, a goal that isn't just about her anymore. It's about something that is bigger, which is her grandma passing away. And I find that really interesting when someone either narrows the amount of time they have to live or they increase the necessity where they're doing it for someone else more than them, their life grows exponentially. Yep. I think that it can work in both ways, like where you've done it, where you've said to yourself, 
mate, I'm not here next week. Like, I'm done. Yeah. I need to start living every single fucking day. Like, it changes uh, your value system. Yeah. Like, yeah, shit, I've got five years. Well, I'm not going to worry about that that I was thinking about doing. I'm not going to worry about going to the pub with the boys again on a Thursday, Friday. Same shit, different you know, day. You're just start going, right, I want to do that. Now, okay, that's a big goal. How do I get there? And you work it backwards. But if you didn't have that initial inception of that five-year question, you'd probably never plan that thing so soon. You're like, oh, I'll give it another five years and we'll get there. You know, we'll save the money, but you might not. So true, you man. might not. So you finished this, you summited this mountain in South yep. America. That one was good. Yep, and then what was next? And it's all in one year, this is. So this is one, this is one big year. So I went from South America to North America. So we flew up to Alaska to climb Denali. So this is a freezing beast of a mountain. It was my first time uh, in snowshoes, first time dragging sleds. And it was my first encounter with uh, crevasse fields. So the mountain there, as, as the, the mountain comes down, it forms a glacier, so this big frozen river, and then it fractures, making these sort of, um, it's like cavernous, deep black holes of despair. Yeah? And so if you go in one of these, you're, you're having a real bad day, you're not coming out. <laughs> But these, these touch in the void style thing. Absolutely, and these yeah. cracks in the um, glacier, these crevasses, are covered with a veneer of snow. So it could be a foot thick, could be a couple of meters thick. You just you don't know. So you're crossing this sort of stuff. So it's pretty hairy. But we have an amazing trip. Brutally cold, you know, minus twenties, minus thirties. Summit day was minus fifty with wind chill, but we're you know all the right gear, and it was an absolutely incredible climb. Pushed me to that next level technically. Okay, because there's a lot more ropes, a lot more ice axe work and stuff like that. We'd summited, great day, and we had a weather window to get off the mountain. So we had to push down as quick as we can, and we come from the summit trying to get back to base camp in about 30 hours. So we're just going all day, all night, and we ended up on that crevasse field that I was talking about in mid-afternoon. It's not the, not the best time to be there, because everything's heating up, and that veneer of snow that I was talking about it takes on the consistency of a slushy. Mm. So now, now you're cruising along and your foot will break through and you'll pull it out and you'll see these black holes. Keep going, you know, boof, your, your leg breaks through. And then you'll fall up to your waist. It's, it's the closest I could ever describe to being in a minefield. Yeah, you just don't know when you're gonna crack through. And we roped in teams of three. And it was during this push off that my back guy on my rope straight through the snow bridge into the crevasse and just swinging free. So the other two is dive on our axes, and then we set up pulley systems and get the other three on their rope team and we tow this guy out. But it's just this hairy moments going through these crevasses. And when you finally put your feet back on terra firma on the other side where you know there's ground under here and not just ice, it's uh, very relieving to say the least. Jeez, man. So that, that was Denali, we have success on that one as well. I guess that makes you realize how grateful you are for every single moment as well. When you see stuff like that, and like you said, just touching solid ground again. Yeah. The simple fucking things in life. Perspective. The biggest thing that the mountains give you on trips like that is perspective. After a, like a massive day, we're climbing up the head wall from camp three to high camp or something like that, it was just huge days, and you're totally knackered. The highlight is just a warm cup of water. You get there at the end of the day, you're just like, oh, how good's this thing? And you're just like sipping it. But... It's funny, like after a few months back in normal world again, you're like, oh, the bloody Wi-Fi, you know, it's taken five seconds to load and you start yeah, getting yeah. upset, you know, oh, I, don't, I want the bagel with the salmon, you know, all yeah, this yeah. stuff, you lose a bit of perspective. And that's why I choose to do these big adventures every year and have since for, for one of those reasons. It just puts life back in its box. Like this is what really matters. This is what it's all about. Yeah, I guess you also realize that you're at complete mercy of nature at the end of the day, whether you're on the mountain or you're off the mountain, like anything can fucking happen to you. She like, detects everything. Mother nature is everything. Yeah. You climb that mountain because the mountain and the weather let you up. That's the only reason. Otherwise, just like the Spanish guys on Aconcagua, change their mind and you snatch your life right out of you. Wow. Yeah. So mountain after this one, we've now done South America. <laughs> Two done. Two done. Uh, an easier one after that, well, traditionally easier, uh, Kilimanjaro in Tanzania. Yeah. So I actually took my dad along on that one. So he did so good. He trained up real hard for it. And we took a longer approach just to acclimatize a bit better. Yeah, it's a big mountain, right? Yeah, it's still five. very high. It's still five, yeah. five, eight, nine, five or something. So it's still yeah. quite high. But you walk up it, am I right in saying, apart from summit days? Just a hike, just high. a hike. Yeah, There's yeah. no snow, none of that yeah, stuff. Yeah. It gets cold. And a lot of people do fail on it because they try and rush. Yeah. So you're still going high, and the last day is an 1,100 meter gain. So it's right. massive. So when you come to mountaineering, acclimatization is everything. So we took a longer approach, um, good push through the night, summoned it out, got the photos, and come back off. It's just a great peak, 
And one that I think I needed in between the two heavy starters was just a good trip with that and, and summed it out on that one. So that was fantastic. Hang on, why did you not do that first? Why did you go straight in? It's all seasonal, it's all seasonal. Oh, so okay. it needed to be um, January down south and then fell into, yeah, so it's all seasonal. And then it was time to go down to Antarctica. So I went down to climb Vincent Massive down in Antarctica. And that's one of the most beautiful places you could ever imagine. So it's, mm. it's untouched by yeah. humans. Yeah, it's one of the only places left that's untouched by us. And the company that sets up these runways where you can fly down and land and then you divvy up into smaller planes and you fly out to these mountains to climb, um, these companies are fully controlled. So they fly out all the urine and all the you know waste and everything off the continent at the end of every season. So it's really, really well run. So went down there, another sled dragging, hauling, super cold, you know, 40s, minus 50s um, attempt, but beautiful. You know, we were successful on that one, pushed to the summit. It was blowing a gale and super cold and everything was like cameras are frozen. Everything was gone by the time we got to the summit and we couldn't stop because it was so cold, we had to keep moving. So I spent about eight seconds on the summit, just lift the ice axe in the air and then <laughs> come straight back down. So all that work just for eight seconds. We've got some photos the next day down lower and, and all that, but yeah, that was Antarctica. And my only regret with that trip was not spending more time there. We're only there for three weeks. There is just a world of adventure down there. I'd yeah. spend months there if I could, if you can afford to live down there, you know? Yeah, every every time I've ever watched like Blue Planet or anything like that, any documentary and I see Antarctica, I'm just like, what the fuck? That is stunning. It's crazy. And when you're flying out in these little fixed wing planes, only like six years in yeah. this little plane, you're staring out yeah. the window. Unbelievable, because the ice sheet because we're not actually climbing like Kilimanjaro, the mountain from base to top. You, know, you can see the whole mountain. Yeah. Down there, you're climbing the tops. So the shelf can be three kilometers thick ice right up to this top of the mountain sticking out. And we go climb that thing and come back down. It's just incredible down there and just white, pristine environment. So you say untouched. Yeah, That's incredible. Right incredible. Right, cool. So Antarctica's done. Three are off the list. What's next? So that was the four off the four, list. Four, four, four off the list. Now we went to uh, West Papua. So it's climbing Karsten's Pyramid. So this one's a bit different. It's uh, all a rock climb. Uh, but to get there, we had to do about seven days approach through the jungle. And I'd done a lot of jungle before in the military, some of the thickest jungle, but nothing like this. This was, this was next level jungle. And to travel through this area, we had to employ porters. And because there were so many different tribal areas, you had to get porters from every village to keep the peace or it can be a problem, they won't let you through. So we ended up with about 20 something porters, guys. And then they bring their wives, their kids, friends, anyone who's not doing nothing, come along. So we ended up with about an entourage of 50 people <laughs> going through the jungle with them. Uh, but it was, it was amazing. They're really, really nice people, very primitive. They still wear you know, wooden dick tubes and have bows and arrows and stuff mm. like that. Um, but beautiful people and strong. Like could hike all day, cut jungle down, build your bridges across rivers, anything you wanted they, they could do for us. So we got to the mountain, to the base, and it's just this, um, sort of like a shark's fin ridge that just comes up out of the jungle and, and Carson's is at the top of that. So they drop us a base camp, the porters all head back down the valley a few hours just to this uh, like cave system. And that's where they camp up and they smoke the thing out and live there for a few days while we're climbing. And up we go, mate, beautiful climb, non-technical really, a little bit of fixed rope stuff, but uh, about 13 hours to get up and back down to base. And we summoned it out on a, on a pretty nice day and just had some great photos up there. 13 well, hours, one go. Yeah, just one big push and it was beautiful, it was beautiful. The problem with that trip, when we got back down, uh, a big monsoon sort of came in, soaked everything, and we were, we were fine. We were just you know, eating and celebrating at base camp. But down in the cave system with the porters, the rain had seeped through and dislodged a slab of rock. And that rock had come down and crushed the porters and it had killed one of these young guys. And in, in that part of the world, I know it sounds crazy, but it's, it's an eye for an eye. In their, in their simple world, it's just an eye for an eye. And so the elders of the sort of tribal bunch um, come charging up at about midnight, machetes, spears, just coming to sort of kill one of us because one of them had died and they're on this trip because of us. So it's this big scene, we're all waking up, he's slashing the ground, you know, slashing the tents and, and our interpreter's trying to calm everything down. So I know this, calm down, it's all good, rah, rah. And we found out what happened. They go, look, we'll come down at dawn, we'll assess everything and we'll see what's going on because we didn't really understand what was happening. But they, they said, okay, that's fine. And off they went. And, and then come dawn, myself, Dean, and our interpreter um, went back down the valley to see these guys. The re we left the rest of the team up there. We had a two-way connection with them, but we lost that after a little while. So we ended up back down the valley. We're cruising in, and 
and I was sort of fresh out of the military, you know, it only been a number of years, and you're running what if scenarios in your head. It's like, what if we get here and they try and, you know, chop us up? Or what if I get here and this happens? Like you run all these scenarios, so you're like, fuck, you know, and you're thinking like escape and evade over there and all this crazy shit. Anyway, we get there, uh, a lot of them are upset. We see the body, he's banged up, he's got clear stuff from his ears, he's swollen, he's not looking good. And Dean and I are just looking at each other going, we're, we're fucked. Like, we're gone. And Dean being, he was like a uh, mountaineering medic, he goes, we'll just go through the procedure here. And he dropped down, he's checking the body. And there's a slight rise and fall of the chest. So this, this guy's not dead. He's just alive, just hanging on. We're like, holy shit, here we go. The only way we could get out of this whole scenario was to try and save this dude's life. Yeah. He was only like 19, he was a kid, hey? And so, right, we've got to get him out. Now, we couldn't go back through the jungle seven days to save him. All we could do was try and make for this big mine. Now, there was a mine over the ridge. It's only maybe three, four hours away, but it was in an area where we were told by everybody, the embassies, the adventure company, anyone we talked to, to stay away from. It's a huge pit owned by an American firm under attack from the Free Papua rebels. It's got huge humanitarian issues, so it was a big no-go zone. That was our only chance to get him there. So we had the porters build a stretcher, load him up, and off we go. And we get to the edge of this pit, Dean and I just try to land and wave down some trucks, and then security comes, and down they all come, and they see the body, and mate, they called the ambulance. So they brought out the mine ambulance, we load this kid in the back, off they go, and we're like, fucking happy days, we've saved the day here. And uh, so we're sitting down with the elders at the end, we thought we've done it, and then my what if brain again starts assessing, and go, oh, what, if, what if this kid dies tomorrow? Or what if he dies in three days, and we're in the middle of the jungle with this crew, what's gonna happen then? So Dean and I put these questions to the group, to the, the elders, and they couldn't really give us a straight answer. And they said, oh, yeah, maybe it's okay. I'm like, all right. So we go back to the team and we have this conversation. It's like, guys, this could happen. We could get back to Shugapa, this is their village in the jungle, um, and this, they find out this kid's died, this is one scenario, you know, what does everyone want to do? And we decided as a team to not take that chance, and we decided just to try and punch through the mine. So we let our porters go back to the jungle, we load up and we tromp into the mine. And it was almost like a changing of the guard there. They weren't receptive, they arrested us all, threw us in a shipping container, and it turned into a bit of an international incident. We ended up being locked up there for seven days in this container. Um, they were feeding us a little bit every day, but the team dynamics were breaking down, people were cracking, and it was, it was a pretty, pretty shitty time, to be honest. So the miners, Locked you up. It was the security firm that works Work for the, the mine, mine. Okay, and there was okay. a big separation in command. So the mine manager didn't even know we were there for the first three, four days. Once he found out through the embassies and everyone else that knew we sort of got locked up here, um, they started to, to get stuff moving. And long story short, we ended up getting smuggled out, dressed as miners at like two in the morning to a waiting helicopter that flew us down to Tameka, this other little town, where we transferred to an airliner that flew us out to Bali. So it's like this little mission to get out of this place after a week. So that was that trip. <laughs> shit, bro, shit. And we've got two more to go. We've got two more to go. Yeah, yeah. So the next one was in uh, Russia. So trying to climb uh, Mount Elbrus, the biggest one down south. And uh, technically simple again, but as we discussed earlier, it's all on Mother Nature. So I hired one guy, just his name was Valentin, and we were gonna do a nice fast ascent. Like I'd done a fair bit of climbing at this stage, I'm confident, strong, he says, we're gonna go for it. And I had limited time, so I had the only, I only got a seven day visa in country to pull this thing off, because I thought, yeah, we'll smash this out. And they're very strict on visas there, right? So you had to like register everywhere you go and show your passports everywhere, and if you overstay, it's, you know, and they get locked up in a gulag or something. But we had a crack at it, and we were going really, really well, but when we were about four hours from the summit, Mother Nature just shut us down. Just full wide out, we had to turn around and we come back down off the mountain. So we had a day of rest, we had plenty of time for another crack, so we had a few more days, and um, up we went again. This time uh, we got within you know, a couple of hours, you could see the, the south summit, which was our target, it's a little bit higher. Mother Nature just shut us down again. The winds were coming up, right in our face, howling, started to be wide out conditions, and. Um, and we had to turn around. And Valentin, like we were hiding behind a rock for ages just talking about it and um, he said one thing to me that, that I never forgot and it was, it's better to come to the mountains 10 times and go home than to come once and never go home. And um, when he said that to me, I knew we'd failed. I said, oh, you're right, we're going down. I know, we're out of here. 
So we turn around and we start making our way down the mountain. We then notice off to our right on this other ridge, there was a crashed helicopter up there. And Valentine's like, oh, we'll go over here, we'll get out of the wind, out of the storm, we'll try and hide in the, in the wreckage mm. and um, maybe it'll dissipate and we can go up later. I was like, yeah, let's do that. So we get over there, we wedge the door open, I fall inside, slam it shut to cut off the wind. And um, as I pop my head up, there's a AK-47 straight in my face. And there's a Russian soldier in there. And Valentine's yelling at him, he's yelling at Valentine on their account, holy shit, what's gonna go here? And um, it, it's his job to look after this downed helicopter on the top of this mountain. And he was freaking out, he didn't know what we were doing there, Valentine didn't know he was there. And he forced us back out into the storm, wouldn't let us stay. So no, you gotta go, you gotta go. So off we went back outside and fought our way down the mountain. And we took a little celebration pick, me and Valentine, once we got out safely back at base camp and said our goodbyes. So that was uh, my first big failure, or, you know, mm-hmm. my first one that I you know, couldn't pull off. And it was also the time where I ran out of money. So that was my end of the year, ran out of money, first failure, but overall a massively successful year. From where I was a year earlier to being at the end of this year where I'd you know, climbed you know, five of these biggest peaks on the planet and then failed on number six. This is unbelievable, you know, so there's definitely no regrets and plenty of good stories to share afterwards. Wow, wow. <laughs> so let's, let's delve into those. So number seven, is that done yet or is it still So that's wet? Everest. Now, so. once I was in this world now, so I'm gonna, I'd call myself an adventurer, okay? Right. Still needed to work, so I'm working, I'm going on little trips, this and the other. Whenever I had a kitty built up to go on another adventure, something would pop up. So I'd go and do something else. So I'm trying to improve on climbing and all this other stuff. And then out of the blue, I get an invite by a British team to go and row across the Atlantic. So they had a cool. team where they were riding their bikes from London down to Portugal. Yeah. From Portugal, they're gonna row across the Atlantic to try and get to Brazil. And then they're gonna ride their bikes again to Rio as part of this Olympic ceremony build up. But one of their teammates after getting to Portugal had appendicitis, had to pull out, and they thought they're gonna to have to cancel their whole expedition. As luck would have it, in a bar in Portugal, they met a friend of mine who knew the sort of life that I, I live, you know, free to do whatever, and I'm ready for anything, physically, mentally. He just put my hat in the ring, he said, guys, you don't have to cancel, let me call a friend of mine. And he did, and I got on a Skype chat with the team straight away. They asked me to join. I said yes, straight away. Then I walked back into the bungalow and asked, my girlfriend, now my wife, um, can I go? And uh, she said, yes, of course. And two days later, quit the job that I was doing at the time. Uh, day after that, flew to London. Day after that, flew to Portugal. And within 10 days, we were taking our first strokes out into the Atlantic. How much rowing had you done before you got onto that? Oh, boat? none. No, no, no official rowing, uh, like how, on the how water. How far is the road? 6,400 kilometers. 6,400 kilometers. <laughs> Yeah, well, after I said yes, I went to the gym and I sat on an erg, because yeah, yeah. they said we have to do two hours of rowing, two hours of rest, 24 hours a day. I was like, two hours, yeah, okay, I'll go sit on an erg. So I sat there on an erg for about an hour and 10 minutes, I go, ah, got this, no problem. What pace are you doing? Ah, slow, very steady. But what I quickly realized as soon as we got on the water, it's nothing like an erg. <laughs> the boat's Stable moving left, that. right, up and down, it's double sculled. These guys were all pro rowers. They'd been in like school up to university level Oxford rowing. Oxford and Cambridge rowers, right? Like. Yeah, like sick with that stuff. I didn't know anything about it. I'm just this big engine that's come along for the journey. Yeah, um, not built like a rower. Oh, mate, I was, I was big. I was a little bit bigger than I was now, super lean. I was in, um, yeah, we do a lot of CrossFits. I was doing CrossFit comps yeah, and all yeah. that. But it, it destroyed me. It tore my body to pieces. It is is by far the most suffering I'd ever done on any trip ever. Um, it took us 55 days to cross, doing two hours on, two hours off, 24 hours a day. I dropped 14 kilograms of muscle weight, gone, and your body adapts to life on the ocean. So your ass is gone, it's now just a flap of skin that's just covered in boils and salt sores and your skin's deteriorated. Everything that's not being used for rowing or to keep you alive, like systemically, gone. Yeah. It just disappears. Yeah, including your vision. I remember seeing a picture of you and you, <laughs> How would you describe that picture to people? The one at the end of that trip, where you're staring with that thousand yards there. Oh, mate, just hardship, just yeah. hardship. Like, because they had a beautiful big beard like this, but your eyes are glassed over, full of tears, but you just, you're hardened, 
to a point where you can deal with suffering on a new level. Yeah. Like when I stepped off on the shore, it's after 55 days, I couldn't walk anymore. So my dad's there holding me up and, you know. Of course, you didn't take any steps, have you? No, you so I couldn't, you, I just fell straight over in the water. So dad's picking me up because your body had adapted to the, to the rock and roll of the ocean. So much so that when we were coming in on our last day, like we'd seen this little bead of green of Brazil coming about 14 nautical miles out. And we're like, fuck, we've made it. And we're celebrating and this and that. And as we're coming in, the flotilla of media and family are all coming out on their boats. And we were having a beautiful day. We thought it was flat, you know, flat as coming in, beautiful day. But then we saw the boats that they were on getting pummeled by these three meter swells. And we are like, holy shit, like, it's actually super rough today. But to us, it was flat. Now, when I got off on the, off the boat onto the shore, which is flat and stable, I fell straight over. Straight over, you just, your balance is all out. And that took about two weeks to correct to come good before I could get up at night and go for a piss without boom hitting the wall. Mm. So it's, uh, it, was, it was an incredible journey and that one taught me what, one big lesson and, and I actually conjured up a little mantra that I wrote on the roof of the, the little boat. So every morning I'd wake up, every two hours I'd wake up and see this. It was, be grateful, you deserve this, thank you for allowing me to suffer. Mm. And so to handle that hardship that we were going through I just learned to be grateful for it. You know, as hard as it was, there could be millions of people out there that would trade their lives for hours in a second for the, for the privilege of trying to get a world record and, and rowing this ocean. And so just reading that, it's like, be grateful for the suffering, you deserve it. It's like, yeah, let's go, another two hours, you know. I guess it's a mindset shift to start welcoming pain into your life as mm -hmm. a positive for growth and survival. Yeah. Instead of seeing it as this thing that is painful it's well in, in normal life our whole concept is to avoid, avoid pain, pain at all costs yeah. whether it's emotional or physical yeah. it's like, oh i got a little niggle panadol or oh, i got this yeah. you, know, you just try and dull it all out yeah but there's benefits to it like, you can push you into some mental states where you learn a lot about yourself like, you find what the hell you're really made of yeah. whether you crack under the pressure or you you start thinking of different ways to handle this type of suffering because it's it's next level Mm. And that little mantra, that philosophy, I've carried through to the rest of my journeys. Are people too soft in today's world? I wouldn't categorize everyone as soft. I think a lot of people have massive talent and they could achieve some incredible things, but they don't test themselves. People just avoid pain, they avoid the challenge, they avoid the hardship, um, just because that's the way that society is now. You know? It's all about the work and the pleasure and just careers and mortgages and kids and all this stuff. But what you can learn and what you can experience and feel when you go through a bit of hardship and on these type of challenges is, is unbelievable. And it just elevates your life to something you know, incredible. Wow, man. So you did the row. And then was Gobi the next one? Yeah, so... We're nearly at the end of the story. Yeah, 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 we're, we're catching up, the years are coming. So coming. Yeah, finished the row, I was obliterated, so it took me a long time to recover. And I'm going to get that picture up, by the way, in the show notes. Like, everyone check that out. It's it's like, shit, man. It's, yeah, you look it's, like you've taken every drug in the world, haven't eaten for however many days, and literally been dragged through the bottom of the ocean I for know. 54 days. And you know, that picture, that like before and after for the row, um, when I was doing my book tour back home recently and I had all these pictures of me and they're doing all this media stuff, that actually became my drug addiction picture. They're like, look at him, he's like, because he's all emaciated and, and fucked. He's like, yeah, he's a drug addict, but now he's a published author, this and that. I go, no, no, that was me, I'm the picture. Yeah. It's like eight years later. Yeah, yeah, they're like, ah, do what you want with it, I don't care. Um, but yes, yeah, so after the row, um, Elise was my girlfriend now and we got married and then she wanted to go on a big adventure. How did you get married? So we got, we got married outside of Vegas um, in a hot air balloon just over the desert. And it was just us two, the priest and the little flame guy. We got married and then we skydived out of it and landed down in the desert under parachutes. So it was, uh, it was an amazing day. Wow. Amazing day. She's a good woman. <laughs> so that was the start of our adventure life together. Um, and she wanted to go on a big adventure. You know, she'd seen me suffer and how much I got out of it and how much other people got out of me sharing the story and she wanted to test herself. So we started with a bit of a walk and it just sort of grew and grew and grew and the idea we come up with was to cross the Gobi Desert from west to east, um, dragging carts with all of our supplies in it. So we recruited a mate, a British, British mate named Matty, he come with us, we built three carts, loaded these puppies up, we got dropped on the western edge of the desert in Mongolia, the Gobi Desert, and we started out. So 
We only made it 6Ks our first day. Our carts were 160 kilograms in weight. We had all the food we'd need for 70 days. We had water drums. We had sat phones and kit and all this sort of stuff. Did you try and do it vegan as well? Is that correct? Well, we were in a big vegetarian kick at, the, at that time yeah, as well, yeah, yeah. You know, trying to be healthy. So we had all vegetarian meals as well. Yeah. So we had to eat a lot yeah. to keep the calories on. So we got 6Ks our first day and we were done. We had to set up tents, finished. Following day, we got about 11Ks. Day after that, we got 16. So over the first week, we started hitting 20s and it just kept building, building and building. And over the course of the 57 day crossing, by the last days, we were doing 40K days, dragging these carts. And the environment down there um, in the desert is incredible, like inhospitable and incredible. It's about minus 50 in winter and about plus 50 in summer. And we're trying to hit the crossing at this middle section where it's not too cold, it's not too hot. But it's also when the most sandstorms are and the winds are. So when these winds come up on certain days, it'd stop you in your track. So you couldn't even take a step forward. The winds were that strong, whipping up the sand. But the highlight of that whole trip was, was the nomad people that live in the desert. Yeah. Absolutely incredible. Because uh, we had to find water all the time. And the rule out there was if there's a family, there's a well. One family, one well. So we had to find these families. They were every 150, 200 Ks. And any time we'd rock in, no matter how destitute they were, you know, if they had a couple of goats, a couple of camels, and just this tiny little girl, you know, the white yurt things, they'd give you something. They'd invite you in for tea, um, give you a, a goat's milk biscuit or some camel milk. They'd give you something, man. Like these people with, nothing. you know, in, uh, in front of your eyes have nothing. Mm. And that was truly amazing. And just the smiles on all the little kids' faces. You know, everyone was always like a mum and dad, a few kids, a number of animals, but the kids were always just wrapped just pumped with life riding camels around smiling and like those little encounters is what made the whole trip you know it broke up that monotonous slog of just walking into the distance every day and um, we covered 1805 kilometers in 57 days so that was the Gobi walk Jeez, man. <laughs> that was last, Incredible. last year that was the most recent one you've done right yeah that was last year mate so and now the, and now obviously Everest is still on the cards at some point I'm guessing still on the list the list is just uh, growing exponentially <laughs> there's uh, a number of big trips on there Everest is definitely one of them now it just comes down to so when I first started for example I spend every dollar I've earned on it and I yeah. still do on adventure but I could not get a single sponsor to save save myself yeah these days, after doing 10 years of it, I have the ability to get sponsors and give them a return on investment for their money. So now when it comes to, okay, I've got 50 grand. What am I gonna do with this? I can go climb Everest. Yeah, it's been done a few times now, still an amazing achievement, but a return on investment for you, my sponsor, is so-so. Mm. Or I can go and say, I'm gonna climb a big mountain in India that's super challenging, shoot the whole thing on film, then I'm gonna kayak the whole Ganges to the mouth of Calcutta, you know, three month documentary, it gives you more um, incentive and yeah. more return on, on that money. So that's sort of how I get distracted every time now. Um, but it's definitely on the list. It will be will be done one day. So you live a very extreme life. Like you've done these crazy crazy trips. You come back to normality. Yeah. How do you how do you fit in, man? How do you? Uh, you know, it used to be tougher. There used to be a a point of adjustment, and I guess it depends on where you're going back into. So when I've had to go from say top of a mountain or you know after the road straight back into the center of Sydney and talk to some corporates like that's in your face you're going from the simplest of existences drinking a whole warm cup of water to now you're in you know man's land of just yeah you know, greed and you know yeah, just yeah. the whole society in the center of Sydney there and it, it hits you in the face like just everything just the, the robbery of everything that happens in that city uh, and you have to adapt to that so you have to just see it for what it is it's just a system you can choose to partake in or you can choose to be a part of, like when I give my presentations and I'm talking to sponsors and dinners and lunches, I enjoy it now, I love it, because it's all part of me being able to go off into the wilderness for three, four, five months of the year. Whereas I used to be like, oh, I hate this, you know, this is what's wrong with humanity and all that, but it's not really. It's how you choose to interact with it, mm. which causes the problem. And if you learn to just use it for what it is, don't let it bury you under a pile of stress and negativity, just say, yeah, man, let's go, like, use it, get in, get out, and then go do what you really want to do. Okay, I want to take this a little bit deeper now. We've got all yeah. the story, we understand what's going down. Why do you do what you do? Why do you do the skydiving? Why do you do the, uh, the not parachute, what's it called? Uh, base jumping. Base jumping, why do you do these crazy rock climbs? Why, why, what's inside of you? What you? What's there? You know what, I think 
in the beginning, there, there was a lot of ego. Mm. You know, I was, a, I was a big, strong guy out of the military, ego, wanted to take everything to the extreme. If we were gonna drink, we're gonna drink, you know, I'm gonna be the best drinker out there. If we're gonna take drugs, I'm gonna be the best drug taker, and you know, there's only one way to go with that. Yeah. And then when I got into adventures, and well, fitness first, and then adventures, I took that to the extreme. But I th- in essence, in, that, in those early years, I was, I was trying to measure up. So I had read these books about the polar explorers, the Shackletons and, mm. and Hillary's and all these guys that in my eyes were the, the pinnacle of what a man or a woman could achieve. You know, that's just hardship and that stoicism and yeah. you know, everything that, that went along in that sort of world. And I wanted to know, do I have that? Do I have that in me? Am I one of these guys or am I less? And that's what I was searching for. I was searching for that, that challenge, that hardship, that suffering, that could convince me, yes, I am, or no, you're not. Over the years, that's evolved a little bit. I'm, I'm searching for, for just my personal absolute limit. And what I've found over the years is to really find your absolute limit, it has to be through experiences that have a fatal consequence to them. So I could say to you, oh, we're going to the gym, we're gonna push to our limit, and we'll push hard. But if you knew you were gonna die if you didn't, how hard would you go? So then when it comes to these adventures, as soon as there was a fatal consequence associated to it, it took you to a new level of suffering, or it took you to a new level of what you could handle mentally and physically. And it opened up this whole nother box, like, wow, that wasn't my limit, I'm going, I'm still going. I think that's what I say to a lot of the, a lot of the uh, fit pros who we work with, when they say to me, oh, James, I haven't got time to do this, or oh, I can't go and get clients, it's too difficult. And these are really small things compared to what you're doing. Mm-hmm. But as soon as I say to them, right, I'm gonna put a gun to your mum's head right now, and I'm gonna pull the fucking trigger if you don't get X amount of clients in the next five days, or whatever it is, or the next yeah. 24 hours. I'm pretty sure that person is going, gonna go and get the most clients they've ever had in their life because of the risk attached to it. Absolutely. And I guess that's why you do what you do, is you can then live life to its full because there is that inherent risk attached to it. Yep. Like as human beings, like you said at the start, pain and pleasure principle, we're never gonna push ourselves to that point until we realize what is the actual payoff if I don't do the thing that I need to do. Yep. And I find that really exciting how you do that every single day. Like you don't need to, but I guess there's an itch that still needs scratching for you yeah. all the time. Yeah. That you have to go and put yourself into that situation, back into that sort of like pressure cooker. Absolutely. Where it's like life or death. Because you you're have, still alive, I'm guessing. Because I'm telling you, no one, you don't know how much potential we have. Yeah. Like this human body and this mind we yeah. have is just this huge ball of potential, but we just never use it. Even me, I haven't used it yet. I don't think. Mm. I haven't hit that point where I was broken on my knees, crying on a mountain somewhere because I just could not go on. I haven't hit that yet, and I want to. Like, I wanna see how far can this vessel carry me when the mind is willing. And the balancing act I have now, so when we're talking about the base jumping stuff where the consequence is instantly fatal for making a mistake, is how to evaluate the risk versus reward. So with the base jumping, when I first got into it, absolutely loved it, incredible. The margin for error is so bloody slim that you have to be on. And I've sort of gone away from base jumping a little bit now to focus on my climbing, but the biggest thing that base taught me was about controlling fear. So I still had fear issues in certain experiences in the mountains and guns to your face and all that. But base jumping sort of taught me about preparation. So every time I got to the edge, so your little parachute on your back, you're standing on a big cliff and your hands are just shaking because you're scared. And you start to go through this mental checklist. Right, have I packed my parachute correctly? Yes, it took me an hour, done, perfect. All right, how's my body position? Yep, I'm good, footing's good. How's the landing area? Yep, it's good. How's the wind? Do you spit check? You go through this little checklist, and then when you get to the end of it, you go, yep, good. And then your hands stop shaking. So there's no more fear anymore. And you want to jump out into that void. So learn, it taught me how to, to control these emotions through preparation and, and really trusting your preparation I as think, well. I think I was, I was watching um, documentary called, uh, I think it's Building Jerusalem, which is where well, the England rugby team won the World Cup in, sorry mate, I know you're Aussie, they won the <laughs> World Cup in 2003. <laughs> yep. And uh, it's the whole process of getting through that. And it opens with Johnny Wilkinson talking about his kicking process. Mm-hmm. And he says, the problem with so many people is, and this is relatable in life as well, and what you've just talked about, is that they're not focusing on the step-by-step process that allows the result. So when you, when you, before you take that jump, you're going through a mental process saying, if I do this, 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 
X result will happen. Yeah. Same thing with Johnny Wilkinson. He's like, if I do this position, then this position, then this position, then this position, the ball will go through the posts. There's no two ways about it. Yeah. I think that's why people get so caught up in fear is because they forget that they're going through a process. So if you can break that down into its like rudimental parts, components, mm. then you can literally achieve fucking anything. And that's the yeah. next question I want to ask you is like... If, they, if they're accountable, like take yeah. accountability for it. Put yeah. it back on you. And that's with base is why I liked it the so ultimate much. Ultimate accountability. It's like, mate, I climbed this peak. I've packed it. I'm going to jump it. It's all on me. You can't yeah. just say, oh, it was that guy's fault. It was this. Yes, that's the problem with that. Why well, I'm not getting so many followers. This, that. You palm it off on everyone. Yeah. Take ownership of it. Be accountable. And then deliver your checklist. And it will, it'll happen. Wow, well, man. So what is, what's, what is unachievable? That's the question I've got to ask you. In your mind, what is unachievable? At the moment, nothing. Like from what, from what I know in my world and everything that I want to do, I know it's all achievable if I pull together everything I need to happen. So, so nothing is unachievable. Absolutely nothing. It's amazing, man. Cool. So we're going to wrap this thing up. A couple more questions for you. Hit me. Um, first one, where do these guys get hold of you? I'm really, t- I want to get this book on camera. We can pick a copy oh, up. Oh, yeah. We can, we, uh, we can give the guys a quick talk through. That's it. So the book, One Life, One Chance. One Life, One Chance. Just going through, you know, the whole journey that we've, you know, discussed briefly in today's podcast. So, a lot of detail in there, lots of adventures, and lots of more to come. Um, guys, if you want to check that out, you can go to my website, olockadventures.com. It's for sale on there. If you're international, just go to Book Depository, online retailer. They give free shipping. They're really good. Um, yeah, if you want to follow me, Luke underscore Olock Adventures. That's it. That's it, man. Awesome. Now, a couple more questions. Yeah. I normally have one more question. Um, but I've, I've got to get some more in here beforehand. So you're a personal trainer as well. You yep. coached a bit before. For sure. Um, and your wife obviously is an online coach as well. Yep. And you guys travel around. How would you manage to have this extreme lifestyle, still make enough money to live, and do all the things you want to do? The biggest thing is your running cost. In any business, it's all about running cost. Yeah. yeah? And um, when it comes to life, it's all about simplifying. So before, I used to have a gym in Sydney. I had a couple of gyms in Sydney, and I had a place on the water, and I had a Jeep, and I had everything that you're supposed to have as a successful Mm. adult male right providing for the world but i had no happiness so we got rid of all that so we got rid of everything and we moved here to thailand with nothing i pretty much gave away the business at the end of the day and then we started in a big bungalow real nice one you know two rooms and this and that and it was a certain price then six months later we scaled down six months later we ended up here smaller 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 so now your running cost is smaller then you do without things. Like we never turn the TV on. Yeah. You don't need stuff. All these little things. As soon as you simplify and you get your running costs down to your true cost, then you're like, right, I need, I think we need here as a couple doing everything we want to do and not working, about 450 bucks a week. That's it in Thailand. So like, right, how do we get 450 bucks? A hundred ways online. You know, uh, one speaking gig for me or whatever. You can just pull that sort of running cost out of thin air. So then you don't have to work. So then you've got so many hours per day to put towards reading books, listening to podcasts, educating yourself with free online courses, networking, meeting people, having experiences. Living. Living. And then you'll find you, it builds up this momentum because all this network and everything you're doing, it just builds this, this force that's coming through the world. And then it's very hard to stop. And you'll never want to go back. Mm. Trust me, you never go back. I could never go back to running a business in a Western world like Sydney again. I would never go back to working 10 hours a day for somebody else. If I'm gonna do 10 hours a day of work, I'd rather do it for myself. Mm. Um, but the, the scariest thing is making that leap. So when I got rid of the businesses and moved here, I had anxiety, like bad, for six months. Do you feel like a failure? Absolutely, in a sense, mm. in a sense. Because I didn't, cause I didn't, walk, around, didn't walk yeah. away with 200 grand check like I should have. I said, no, nah, I want out, I want happiness, and just left it. But after a while, it's the best decision we ever made. Absolutely best decision we ever made. But you just got to get through that social paranoia, that anxiety, and, and start working on yourself. Because that's a big thing for a lot of people. I know it was me when I was in the corporate. It's like your life or your status is based on the significance you get from your job, from your income, the feedback. From, the, from the car you drive, yeah. because of that's what the environment dictates. Yeah. But if you're in ha- unhappy in that environment, like what you did, or you were forced to fucking do it, is to fly, fly to a different part of the world, yeah. where those values aren't held so high. It's now about adventure. It's now about... The stories that you can tell is about actually fucking living and exchanging yep. consumption for actually living. I think is something that really excites me, and like yeah. how you've just scaled down your life to the bare minimum, and that's probably giving you more freedom as well, right? Oh, the freedom is limitless. You can do anything you want to do. No mortgage. No mortgage. No liabilities. Nothing yeah. like that. So nothing holding you back. And when you start looking at your life in that five-year 
gap like we do, you don't have the fear of old age, of pensions, of what am I gonna do when I'm 80? It's like, fuck that. There's a long time between now and then, man. Like, live now and it'll sort itself out in the end, I promise. And the biggest thing we have as Western world people, like the birthright we had being born in, in the civilized world, is we have this safety net. Yeah. Our oh. worst case, mate, I'm flying home, I get my Medicare card and I get my Centrelink card. So it's 200 bucks a week there and a medical. I'm good, I'm starting again. That's my fucking safety net as far as I can fall. And when you have that sort of thing below you, poh, shoot for the stars. Yeah, because that's the thing, like, People always ask me, why did you risk all your job and your income and your, your pension and all of that stuff? Well, there is no fucking risk. Mm. Like, let's be really honest about this. If it goes tits up, I'm on the sofa at a friend's house. I've got the NHS who's always going to support me. I'll still get some kind of pension yeah. or money from someone to feed me. Yeah. But like, even if I get fucking thrown up in prison, I'm still getting fed and bed and I've got a roof over my head. Get to train as well. <laughs> yeah. Like, it's just a shift in actually yeah. saying, am I going to be willing to sacrifice everything to get well, sacrifice nothing to get everything. It's like, what is a success and what is a failure in your world? Yeah. Not in the Western world, in the middle of Sydney, where success and failure are these spectrums that you're never going to achieve and where, you know, failure isn't really failure. Reshuffle the whole thing. Like, mm. success to me now is pulling off a big trip every year. Failure, if I'm failing to my sponsors, is not achieving that, but staying alive. I guess I guess you also realise it puts it in perspective when you are seeing that frozen body on you know that Spanish frozen body, or you've got that gun to your face. You realise that all that material stuff is is nothing. It doesn't matter, mate. It does not matter at all, at all. Awesome, man. So final question we ask this for everyone on the show, and that is, what does freedom mean to you? The ability to do anything you want to do in this world. That's freedom. I want to go deeper, man. I feel like there's more to do. I feel like you've got something in your here. Mate, for freedom to me is to be to free in, in the physical world, so to go and do anything you want to do, right? But also free in your emotional world as well. So I had a lot of anger, I had a lot of fear, I had a lot of these emotions, you know, from the addiction days, from the military, all these hang-ups. And when I was working on myself physically and achieving all these adventure things, I was also doing emotional stuff as well. And that's probably more beneficial because with that emotional control, that delivers real freedom. Freedom of thought, freedom of you know, imagination, everything. And then it really does liberate you, body, mind, spirit, all that stuff, that fluff everyone talks about, it's got to come together as one. And that, that's real freedom. Awesome, man. On that note, guys, one more, one more shout out for the book, One Life, One Chance, Book Depository. Book Depository, yep. Yep, and... Amazon if you're on Kindles, yep. Oh, it's on Kindle as well? Yeah, yeah, Kindle as well. Do you still get the same amount of money? No. Oh, you don't want to know the margins. Don't worry about that. <laughs> buy the book and once more on Instagram, it will be in the show notes, but so the guys can get hold of you on Insta. Luke underscore O-L-O-C adventures. Perfect, man. Awesome. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Pleasure. And uh, guys, please reach out to this guy if you've got any questions. If you're that person who's stuck right now, whether you've got drug addiction or whether you're stuck in a corporate job or you just wanted to make a leap to become an adventure and start living life to the full, I'm sure this guy is going to spend Please some time do. answering Please your do. messages. Help Absolutely. You out. Mate, it's been an absolute pleasure. <laughs> Thank you Cheers, very much. Mate. Appreciate it. Cheers, guys. Thanks for listening to the Remote Revolution Show. If you enjoyed the show, please head across to iTunes, YouTube, and our other social media platforms to leave us a quick rating and review. And if you'd like your questions answering, we'd love to hear from you. So please send them into info at remoterevolutionshow.com. And please remember the show is all about growing the remote revolution. So if you wish to join the community and scale your business, then please head over to www.remoterevolutionshow.com or click the link in the show notes to grab our free download. Yes, seriously, don't be lazy. Click the link in the show notes and grab the downloads. And as always, we'll see you next week.